Welcome back to Posse of the World. I'm Tommy Vitor. I'm Ben Rhodes. Ben, you've been reading a lot of uh, Jean Le Carré lately? <laughs> yeah. Why do I say it with an accent? He's British. Yeah. Well, and it's a pen name. Uh, <laughs> I yeah, I have a piece out in the Atlantic. Uh, I've read so many Le Carré books, but then they put out this collection of his letters, and so I just kind of used that as a hook to write. Who was he writing letters to? Uh, you know, it's actually kind of interesting because, like, he, you know, he has letters to, like, other writers, you know, like Graham Greene and, and Philip Roth and people like that. But then he's got letters to, like, you know, everybody from um, the the person that was the model for George Smiley, like the iconic character. Oh, the, right? like the real person? Y- yeah, the, like the person he actually modeled a Smiley on. And then, like, what I found most interesting is that he, for all these books, he found, like, some guide, Right. So, like, for the Russia house, he had somebody who, like, showed him around Russia. Or then he did something on arms dealers in Congo, and he found somebody to show him around there. And so you see kind of how he, like, approached, and this is part of what the piece is about, he approached writing books like like a spy, recruiting, like, subsources mm-hmm. who then, like, yeah. took him to a place and showed him stuff. And uh, so it's all about how his, like, habits as a spy made him a better novelist and his kind of novelist eye allowed him to write things much more interesting than intelligence products. No yeah. offense, to, yeah, no offense. To, to the intelligence community. No offense yeah. to the intelligence community. Not, not quite as good as like Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. and The, the Lab Leak Report. Yeah, yeah the Lab uh, Leak Report. We'll yeah. get into that we'll later. We'll get That's to that. Yeah. Very cool. I will definitely check that out. Um, we got a lot to talk about today. We are going to cover changes to the electoral system in Mexico, a long-anticipated election in Nigeria. The First Lady took a trip to Africa. The aforementioned uh, COVID lab leak theory and the story that will not ever die. Some big Brexit news, uh, Ukraine, lots of Ukraine news. And then the World Bank gets a new president, uh, immigration policy, and Russian propaganda finds a home. And then, Ben, you guys are going to hear my conversation uh, with Marav Mikhaili. She, the, she is the head of Israel's Labor Party. We talked this morning about Netanyahu's efforts to gut Israel's judicial system. We talked about the uh, scary escalation of violence between Israelis and Palestinians and these like settler riots or some people are calling them pogroms over the weekend. So uh, we covered a lot of ground. Uh, It was good to talk to her and uh, hear how she plans to resuscitate the Labor Party in Israel, which has fallen on some some tough times. Yeah, yeah, a lot of work to be done to kind of bring back the Israeli left, but we all have a huge interest in seeing that happen. Well, that was kind of her big message was basically like, hey, progressives, don't give up on us. Yeah. You know, there's like a lot of people in Israel who feel the exact same way you do about the things Bibi Netanyahu is doing and what the right wing of the uh, government is doing and, like, just know that we're here and don't give up on us yet. Yeah, and, like, she took some crap for, like, not... Uh, for for basically kind of standing outside of, like, a, a broader tent of people in the last election. But at the, at the end of the day, like, these efforts to kind of move center right or join some coalition always end up kind of neutering the left you know at some point you have to draw a contrast and fight on it you know yeah yeah, fight it out uh okay well let's start in mexico uh because there have been some big changes there where lawmakers recently overhauled the country's electoral agency uh, by cutting its staff and limiting its independence and capacity to punish candidates that break election laws so uh president andres manuel lopez obrador or amlo for shorts He's been pushing these changes very hard. He says it's because they will save money and they will make voting more efficient. Uh, it's notable, though, that AMLO has long blamed the uh, National Electoral Institute for his 2006 presidential election loss. He's complained that this is an organization that's controlled by elite. So he's sort of had it out for them seemingly for a little bit. Uh, historically, the Electoral Institute has gotten a lot of credit for helping facilitate fair elections. Uh, and critics of these new changes say that election officials now won't be able to pay workers to organize the elections. They won't be able to put up polling stations on time, maybe. And the Institute uh, will not have the authority to punish candidates that break campaign finance laws. So that's all disconcerting. There have been big protests against these changes in cities across Mexico. The one in Mexico City, uh, organizers say, was attended by half a million people, so very big. In the coming months, Mexico's Supreme Court will hear challenges to the law. So, Ben, it's worrisome to hear critics of these changes say that they could basically weaken Mexico's democracy uh, and make it difficult to carry out legitimate elections. The BBC says these res- the reforms would save Mexico about $150 million a year. So not chump change, but not a lot of money for a, a country that's forecasting $231 billion in tax revenues in 2023. AMLO is not eligible for election, but his party is favored to win in the next election. The U.S. has not said much about these changes reportedly because they just don't want to piss the guy off. We yeah. got a lot of work to do with them. Yeah. 
What do you make of what's happening, uh, the sort of claims on either side? And do you think the U.S. should be bringing public pressure to bear on this guy to make sure the sort of worst case doesn't happen? I mean, I think any time you gut the election commission, it's, it's kind of a red flag. You yeah. know? Um, I flagged that one uh, too. It, yeah, it, it's kind of a warning sign. I mean, I, he, I take AMLO's point, right, that there is a kind of corrupt elite in Mexico. They did run things for a very long time. Uh, they certainly wanted to see him out of power as a leftist kind of populist. But these arguments just don't really carry that much weight. Like, y- you don't really, like, neuter the election commission just to save money. That's not like kind of heavy handed. Yeah. It's not where you find the savings, you know, and, and it is, but you wonder what his play is exactly though, because maybe this is just him having this grievance and finally acting on it. Or maybe this is him. Like he will clearly try to anoint a successor and then kind of be the power behind the scenes in this political party that is mainly an extension of his politics. It, reportedly, two of his candidates in 2021 got basically pushed out of a race by the the election commission, and he thinks that was every year. Yeah, and, and l- so, like, I, I mean, but if he wanted to reform the election commission, that might be a more credible course of action than just kind of neutering it. I guess it's interesting you mentioned this after Israel because uh, part of what I was thinking is that you, you saw these protests, but the Mexican opposition is also kind of a mess, right? The the, the parties, the two parties that would uh, kind of you know, be contesting the next election. And it kind of reminds me, uh, it, like India, Israel, and Mexico are all pretty different countries, obviously. Uh, and AMLO is a left-wing populist, unlike Modi, a Hindu nationalist, or, or Bibi, a kind of right wing or far right uh, nationalist. But in, in each case, there's kind of these groundswell of popular opposition to what are perceived as power grabs. And there's not really a lot of like organized political leadership to the opposition. Mm-hmm. And, and that seems to be a common thread. I mean, uh, you know, for the health of Mexican democracy, like hopefully this kind of popular movement leads to some more coherent, cohesive political opposition. So there's just like a choice put before the Mexican people. Um, I think the U.S., you're right. I think we, we're constantly asking for so much help from Mexico on the border and with cartels that successive administrations in this country and Mexico kind of avoid big direct confrontations. I do hope that there's conversations happening, you know, about this, though, yeah, quietly. Um, quietly. And that if we see things that if the U.S. sees things that suggest an erosion of Mexican democracy, then, you know, there's more uh, vocal commentary on it. But. Um, you know, it's just something to watch uh, be, because, you know, Mexico, for all of its challenges over the years, you know, elections have gone off pretty smoothly there. So, um, you know, you'd hope that uh, I mean, the court if the court rules, for instance, against AMLO, then you would hope that he abides by that ruling. Right. You know, that's, so that's the kind scary. of thing to watch. So there's some this is another warning sign, <laughs> a marker, and we'll see what the court does. And then we'll see how things lead into the next election. Yeah. Sticking with our elections theme here. So. In last week's show, we said we were excited to talk this week about the results of the Nigerian presidential election, which happened over the weekend. That election has huge stakes, obviously, for Nigeria, but also for the continent of Africa and for the world, because uh, Nigeria is projected to overtake China as the second most populous country in the world by 2100. So, you know, big stakes here. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, as of Tuesday, there's not a lot of clarity So far, the ruling party candidate is in the lead with about 40% of the vote, according to BBC News. But three opposition parties, the the People's Democratic Party, the Labour Party, and the African Democratic Congress Party, say that the results have been manipulated and they're calling for a new election. Uh, These opposition parties say there's evidence of vote rigging and that millions of Nigerians weren't able to vote on the correct day because election officials didn't turn up with the right equipment. There are also concerns about this new electronic system that was used to accredit voters and this sort of website or portal that was supposed to be releasing results in real time doesn't seem to be working at all. So kind of Iowa caucus shadow kind of (laughs) vibes. Yeah. Yeah. Where's Mayor Pete? Yeah. Uh, (laughs) As of this recording, uh, the votes are still being counted and tabulated, but the European Union is criticizing poor planning. To win, a candidate needs to get the most votes nationwide and then at least a quarter of the ballots cast in 25 of the 36 states plus Abuja, the capital, or else there's a runoff. So, Ben, kind of the worst case uh, outcome here, you know, like I I hope they can sort this out and come to some accommodation, but very, very worrisome. It is very worrisome. I mean, it's pretty clear that things did not go off right (laughs) in this election, you know. I mean, uh, the, the, the concerns or charges of vote rigging will have to 
be, you know, obviously looked at and scrutinized. But even without that, um, it's clearly this was chaotic. Clearly, stuff didn't work. Clearly, didn't people, set up polling yeah, elections. people couldn't. Yeah. I'm mean, talking about the need for a good election commission, totally, you know, yeah. um, to to bring these two stories together. Um, and so there's a cloud over this election. And I would just hope that whatever process kind of adjudicates this, if it's just this ruling party, which you know has been fairly corrupt in the past, and there was, I think, a sense among a lot of people that some change would be an improvement here, um, a kind of new generational change or a different kind of political party leadership. Um, if this is an effort to just ram through a result that is deeply flawed without some process of adjudication and, you know, a runoff, I mean, it just feels like this could be combustible because, I mean, you're talking about Nigeria, a country that you've had civil conflict, you've had you know, political violence uh, in recent years, uh, particularly in the north with uh, Boko Haram. I mean, there, there are real challenges inside of Nigeria. And the success of Nigeria is so important to certainly that part of Africa where we've seen some democratic backsliding. We've talked about a bunch of coups in that part of mm -hmm. Africa recently um, and just the continent generally. I mean, to, to, to again, link these stories, you know, I I've talked a bit about kind of swing states, the states, that the countries you kind of watch for the health of democracy. We we spend so much time kind of looking at the United States and Europe, but you know ultimately it's it's like the Mexicos, the Nigerias, the Indonesias, these very big important countries that are kind of regional hubs of democracy around the world. You hate to see, um, you know, well, both stories we've led with today. You know, a sense that kind of the fragility of democracy in these places. Um, on display. So I, I think the focus here should be on determining what went wrong, being very transparent about that, and having kind of an agreed upon process that allows everybody to, you know, uh, uh, participate in, 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 in determining who the ruling party is going to be. Yeah, forward. it's really sad. I mean, I, I was listening to and reading a lot of coverage leading up to the election. And you know, there were sort of a lot of, you know, older candidates who yeah. had been around for a while, but you kept hearing all these young people who yeah. were so excited to vote, so excited about the future and making a change and participating in democracy. And for this to be the, the current state of the outcome is is terrible. Yeah, and part of the that's part of the problem in Nigeria. I mean, you're talking about like one of the younger countries in the world, yep. a Africa, the youngest continent in the world. And you've got these leaders like Buhari, I mean I think he spent like months and months like in Europe getting medical treatment. This guy was like old when he was elected, like, uh, you know, uh, and really old. <laughs> and, and so you just have a sense if you look at a Nigeria, you have such a dynamic culture and civil society and popular culture and mm -hmm. athletics and, and, and a huge like entrepreneurial uh, business community. And it just doesn't seem to enter into politics at the national leadership level, you know, and and so what you'd really like to see is that kind of generational change and that kind of energy that is making a lot of progress in other sectors of society come into politics. And s thus far, this result does not showcase that. No. Speaking of Africa, uh, First Lady Jill Biden recently took a five day visit to Africa. She spent a bunch of time in Kenya and spoke with women and families who really were on the brink of starvation because there have been five failed rainy seasons in Eastern Africa, and they're about to experience a sixth, which basically means there's insufficient rainfall to grow crops or raise livestock. Uh, the UN says nearly 23 million people in Kenya, Ethiopia, and Somalia are highly food insecure. That means they don't know where their next meal will come from. Uh, while in Kenya, the First Lady called for more international aid to help with drought relief. She also faced lots of very annoying questions about uh, whether her husband might run for president again. Um, Jill Biden last visited Kenya in 2011. She was there to raise awareness about a previous famine. This one is supposedly worse. Uh, she's been to Africa six times total. Uh, Darlene Superville at the AP had a lot of great coverage of the trip if you want to read more. But Ben, I thought it was great to see uh, Jill Biden in Kenya for this trip. I think she specifically said... You know, there's a lot of attention on Ukraine right now, Ukrainian refugees, the war, a lot of money going that direction. And she was trying to raise awareness and kind of you know help on the margins uh, so they can get some more attention on what's happening in Eastern Africa, bring in some more donor money, hopefully get some governments to kick in more cash. You know. Yeah, no, I think showing up is really important in Africa and something that that the U.S. doesn't always do <laughs> at, at, a, at a high level, you know. So yeah. I think this is a good use of her time and her effort to spotlight issues. I, I will say... I noticed those interviews too, like the, 
you know, they clearly pitched like some interviews where she was going to talk about Africa. And, I, you know, it used to drive me crazy. We'd go to Africa and we'd do the same thing, you know, uh, press briefings, interviews, and, and nobody ever asked about Africa. <laughs> they just asked about, you know, whatever dumb political story was happening back home, which kind of sends its own message. You know, like you can't ask an administration to spotlight things like food insecurity in Africa, or she went to countries like Namibia where nobody ever shows up at that level of the U.S. government. And, and then when the media kind of acts like it's just, you know, totally relevant and that 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 is consumed in Africa, too, you know. Um, and, and so I would hope to see a focus not just from the U.S. government, but, you know, from the U.S. political media and others on, on this part of the world that is really central to every, you know, climate change, migration, food security, uh, China obviously mm-hmm. plays heavily in these places, you know, and so I, I think uh, the focus is good, but lo- like needs to be sustained. It needs to be beyond just official visits. It needs to be from all parts of American society, including our, our private sector, our media, as well as our government. So speaking of stories that are getting lots of press attention, there's the uh, COVID lab leak news cycle yes. will never end. The latest turn here is over the weekend, the Wall Street Journal ran a story with this headline. Lab leak, most likely origin of COVID-19 pandemic, Energy Department says. That led to a huge freak out on social media, especially Twitter. Not a particularly nuanced headline. No, yeah. and lots of claims that the issue is now settled, right? And you saw a lot of people dunking on each other. Let's just briefly explain why that's wrong. So again, the debate here is whether COVID jumped from infected animals to humans naturally, or whether COVID spread because of a mistake at a laboratory that was doing coronavirus research. The intelligence community is trying to figure it out. Joe Biden, when he came in, I think directed them to like double down on your efforts to figure this out. Different components of the intelligence community have reached different conclusions. There are 18 agencies that make up the intelligence community. Eight of them are looking at the origins of COVID. I assume the other 10 just aren't relevant. Like you're not gonna have the satellite geospatial imagery guys yeah, figuring yeah, this out, yeah, right? They yeah, don't work. Yeah. So of those eight- National reconnaissance agencies. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. uh, two agencies believe that COVID came from a lab leak. So it's the Department of Energy believes with this with low confidence. The FBI believes it with moderate confidence. The National Intelligence Council and four other agencies disagree, and they assess with low confidence that COVID came from natural transmission from an infected animal. Uh, two agencies, including the CIA, are undecided. None of them think this was a bioweapons program from China, which is yeah. like a big Steve Bannon thing. So again, you know, I talked about this on PSA yesterday, Ben, but like low confidence are really the key words here. Uh, The intelligence community after the Iraq WMD debacle tried to be more specific about not only what they believe, but how strongly they believe it. I think that has gotten lost in the reporting about their work since the Energy Department is involved here because they uh, oversee the national laboratories in biological research and they got some new information apparently. The bottom line, just for people wondering, okay, well, what, what should I think about this? Where did COVID come from? Is the U.S. government does not know. Yeah. They are split. Yeah. They are split. And they're split four to two in favor of still thinking this was natural transmission. I don't know what the answer is. I've never known. Um, I kind of just hope, though, that, I don't know, the DNI or the, the, the Evriel Haynes, the director of national intelligence, will be able to just release kind of everything they know publicly that is unclassified. I also kind of wonder still how much this matters three years later. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, because you kind of walked up to the line of the, you know, the bioweapons conspiracy theory type stuff, but it gets even worse in that, right? Too, because in the fever dreams on the right, it's also like Dr. Fauci somehow initiated this, right? Because yeah. oh, sure. he, he started doing some stuff in labs that then the Chinese did, and there was funding from, you know, NIH with the Chinese. And um, and that's just crazy Bonkers. stuff. I mean, Bonkers, this, yeah. is, th- this is one of those issues where people are project, talk about projecting. I mean, COVID generally, you know, obviously much commented on, you guys have done a good job in PSA about how, like, you know, mask wearing is a projection of your political views. <laughs> I mean, this is an extreme version of that. Like, you know, this desire to kind of want China to be responsible for this. Um, we should say, first of all, nobody has suggested that China like intentionally created COVID, right? I mean, that's- well, That's like the Steve Bannon territory. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no credible, um, you know, analyst. And then, the, so then you get to this point of like, you know, what was it a lab leak? Now, that's important, I guess, insofar as you'd like there to not be future lab leaks, you know. Yeah. Uh, you, you know. Maybe curtail the gain of function research. Uh, yeah, it, that but was I, what led to this. I think in any event, we should be trying to, like, you know, button down the labs and make sure that whatever experiments are being done with uh, coronaviruses, like, are, are secured. Um, but the reality is we don't know. 
And we don't know for a bunch of reasons. Like you talk about a low confidence assessment, you, you would not make major foreign policy decisions off of a low confidence assessment from a single intelligence agency. I mean, that that is as, is no, no knock to the good people at the Department of Energy, but that's about as weak as it gets in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, because th th the confidence assessments too are based on the fact that they also only look at their their sliver of the the pie. They're they're not even looking at everything everybody else has. So that's not based on like NSA intercepts or, right. or CIA human being intelligence. Undecided. Exactly, it's very notable to me. Which yeah. means we have not found some you know Chinese asset to say yeah actually this was a lab leak. Or and I'm not suggesting we have that great intelligence in China, but like. We have not picked up the Chinese saying to each other, like, oh, no, like mm -hmm. we leaked this from a lab, you know. Right. Now, some of this is on China because they didn't open up, you know, part of the reason we'll never know really right. is that there was no real credible, transparent investigation. There was a black box in terms of what was happening in Wuhan in those early days. And, and look, this is an interesting conjecture and people will continue to pull this thread. But like. We don't know anything more about what happened, I think, because of this assessment than we did before. It, it doesn't mean it's not worth doing. It just means that, like, different people are going to have different theories, and we should do whatever we can to act on the series. So if there's anything that DOE, the Department of Energy, found that suggests how to increase, like, the safety and security at labs, okay, do that. It doesn't mean to draw some sweeping conclusion about the origins of COVID, you know? Yeah, it's just such a frustrating conversation because... I agree with the people who say it was ridiculous for, say, tech platforms to um, to ban discussion of the lab leak theory on their platforms at some point. Uh, I, I agree with the people who say that, you know, the WHO saying, you know, ruling out a lab leak at some point or so like some people are too definitive in saying, no, that was not possible. Um, all that said, like the conversation has evolved so much over time that initially it sort of did start with this more nefarious yeah. connotation that this was a bioweapon or, yeah. or that this was a purposeful thing uh, by the Chinese government done to harm the United States or the world. And like the lack of logic there or the sort of anti-Asian uh, sentiment and, and rhetoric and violent acts that happened in this country that seemed to be spawned from some of those debates we're really troubling, right? And so it's just, I don't know, it's, it's a very frustrating conversation on social media. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Well, and the other thing, and this, like, I remember having this conversation with you, like, two years ago when this came up, but, like, the people who wanted to be a lab leak, you, you know, kind of wanted to be a lab leak, right? I'm not suggesting it's not possible there was a lab leak, but th there seems to be this suggestion that that would then embarrass the Chinese or, or be, like, a black mark against them. What I never understood about this, Tommy, is, like, they're also not supposed to have wet markets with like live that you know like the after SARS you know yeah, right. they passed some you know they weren't supposed to have the kind of markets where this could happen either right and so I, 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 I never really understood the kind of gotcha piece of this um, it's not like the Chinese are going to come out and surrender you know uh, because of the Department of Energy's low confidence assessment I, I, the point should be we should learn as much as we can about this um, to prevent it from happening again um, and, and, and look I, I just the one thing lesson we should also take from this is everybody at times made statements that were too categorical, like the WHO, mm -hmm. Fauci. But, yeah. you know, to Fauci's credit, I, I, if you actually listen to him, he would always say, like, this is the best information we have at the time. Nobody ever listened to that right. part of his statements. Yeah. But I think we've all learned, you know, we're not all epidemiologists. And even the epidemiologists aren't, like, all knowing at any given and time either. It's a new you know? virus. Yeah. It's a novel coronavirus. It's like, yeah, it's very frustrating. I would love to know the answer. I don't know that we will. It might take years, if not decades. My guess is that spies won't figure it out, that a bunch of scientists will. Yeah. And we're just going to have to wait. And, well, what we don't know is whether the Chinese know something that we don't know. You know, like, and, and that that's the nature of their government. I mean, whether, because uh, that's what I'm most curious about is, like, do they actually know the answer to this and they're not telling us? Or maybe they don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's plausible. Yeah, it's plausible. Uh, okay, we had some big Brexit news, which is that the UK and the European Union cut a deal to end their dispute over trade rules for Northern Ireland. The agreement uh, even has a cool name, I'm hearing, Ben, the Windsor Framework. Very cool name. I like that. Yeah. Uh, so here's the problem and the proposed solution. After Brexit, uh, Ireland remained part of the European Union, but Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK, had to exit the EU. Ireland and Northern Ireland are the same landmass. They share a land border. No one wanted to create a barrier between those two countries or customs checks because of concerns that could unravel the Good Friday Agreement and the fragile peace in Northern Ireland. So what this new agreement uh, negotiated by Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and the European Commission does is say, 
goods moving from Britain to Northern Ireland go through one process without customs checks. Goods passing from the UK through Northern Ireland then to Ireland go through a different process with more checks. The deal also reduces the role of the European uh, Court of Justice in enforcing these rules. So it's very technical, very complicated, frankly, very, very boring, but it has huge implications uh, because if Brexit uh, undid the Good Friday Agreement, it would have been a disaster. So Ben, just stepping back, it does seem like this is a very rare uh, win for Rishi Sunak, (laughs) who's been struggling when he really needed one. Uh, And two, I read that Sunak said he was going to put this to a vote in parliament, even though some people don't think he needs to do so. Maybe that's in part because the Labor Party has suggested they'll support some sort of reasonable agreement, which is just another sign that like Labor's position on Brexit is pretty firmly, we're going to live with it. We're not going to try to undo it. Like what's done is done. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, no, this is a pretty big deal. And um, I mean, I'm actually going to, you know, we've been pretty hard on the Tories. Like this is like a pretty good win for Rishi Sunak. Yeah, you know, it, um, it 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 kind of closes one of the big open accounts from Brexit, um, assuming it it implements well and it works. Uh, and it kind of plays to his strengths because it's kind of it's very technocratic, right? He's down in the weeds of like customs controls and um, and 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 it showed the European Union also wanting to get past this too, right? So the, that's the first thing is it it kind of. Here's this technocratic guy after Boris Johnson and, and crazy Liz Truss, you know, just kind of getting down the weeds and, and negotiating this. Second point is it's you remember we used to talk about like a hard Brexit and a soft Brexit. And right. this is like softer than what Boris Johnson wanted to do with Northern Ireland. Right. Um, and so one of the reasons why labor, I think, would support this is because it moves more in the direction of, of a softer Brexit in terms of the kinds of custom controls and the, the prioritization of protecting the Good Friday Accords, which Boris Johnson didn't seem to, to care that much about. So that removes a potential irritant to with the United States, which is like deeply invested in, in the Good Friday Accords. Right. right? Biden, uh, I think, have been pushing hard on this. And they want the, the UK government wants Biden to visit around the anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. Yeah. And so this opens the door to that. And that would be you know another good thing for, for uh, the Rishi Sunak uh, government. Um, third thing that's interesting to me about this is, is King Charles played like seemed to play some role it was like i mean not, i don't think he was negotiating but like it's at windsor like that's his you know i think he you know he's a windsor right the house of windsor right he had tea with the uh the eu negotiator um after this is completed he's getting some shit actually i think in in the uk from some people for being involved in in this in any way but it does suggest like king charles wanting to be a little bit more visible and active and and that's kind of interesting to me too because We've been talking a lot about what is post-Brexit UK and, I don't know, maybe it's like a more active monarch or something because that's something that makes them distinct, that they have this kind of weird monarchy and family that is there. Um, so that's that's notable and it'll be interesting to see how that, that shakes out. Um, you also got a sense that like the, the hardline Brexit people didn't complain about this deal as much as like some people thought they would if, if the UK made some concessions uh, on this, which suggests kind of overall just fatigue with these yeah, arguments. Yeah, I think the European you know? Commission was probably fatigued too. Yeah, it's just like, fucking let's, let's get, get over it. Going. Now, it doesn't solve all the problems. I mean, like we've already already talked about their massive economic problems because of losing that market. It doesn't solve their, they have a labor shortage because it's like they, they're keeping people out of the UK. Like So they still have a bunch of problems from Brexit. This just kind of deals with one of them. We'll still have to see whether Northern Ireland, which has not had a government, uh, whether the political parties there now can can come together, the Democratic Unionist Party, that's the kind of pro-UK party there versus the, you know, Sinn Féin, the, the IRA um, legacy party. But look, it's it's uh, it doesn't change my overall opinion of the Brexit, the Tory party or Rishi Sunak. It solves one little problem. What it may also do is help kind of Rishi Sunak put Boris he, behind that's him, a big, right? I was about to say that. Yeah. Rishi Sunak, like Boris Johnson's been running around the world. He's been going to Ukraine. He's been acting yeah. like he's still the prime minister. Liz Truss is coming to the United States, giving speeches, stepping on all over Rishi Sunak. Like they're trying to humiliate him over and over and over again. And this is finally a chance for him to assert himself a little bit. Yeah. And, like actually look like the prime minister. Yeah. And say like, I look, I just did something that Boris couldn't do, yeah. you know? And, and I think that may consolidate his position as leader of the conservatives heading into the next election. Yeah. Uh, let's turn to Ukraine because there's been lots of news there. Uh, we are learning more, Ben, about the White House concerns uh, about China potentially selling arms to Russia. So CNN reported that 
The specific concern is about the sale of drones and ammunition. And then CIA Director Bill Burns went on CBS this weekend, and he said that the U.S. is confident that Chinese leadership is considering providing lethal aid, but they haven't made a decision yet. Uh, For their part, the Chinese put forward a 12-point plan to end the war. This was apparently offered without any real consultation with Zelensky or the Ukrainian government. It is generally viewed as sort of a pro-Russia document because it calls for an end to sanctions against Russia and kind of blames obliquely other countries for the invasion, meaning like the West, not Russia. Um, Let's pause there, though. Like, I'm curious what you make of this strategy to push China very hard, very publicly. I both understand it and I will concede that the White House did some interesting things in releasing classified information, uh, declassified information sort of early on in the war. But I also worry here that in the wake of the balloon mess and everything else that you could see the Chinese getting their backs up and not wanting to look like they had been bullied by the United States out of an arms sale that they feel like there is their sovereign right. Look, first of all, when like Bill Burns, you know, uh, we worked with him. And I worked with him for I don't know almost seven years. Uh, the most deliberate man on the face of the earth. You know, like every word that guy says has he's thought about it. He doesn't do a lot publicly. He doesn't do a lot of press. Uh, so you know, we we always called him the stash because he has like just a killer mustache. Like when the stash comes out and says something like this, like that is some serious shit. Okay, Sunday show stash. Like just like stop what you're doing. Pay attention to this guy. Like, this is the result of a process. This is not like a, you know, he's not saying something by accident. Yeah, no. So just to underscore, like, they are clearly seeing things in the intelligence that make them believe yeah. that China is going to do this or is planning to do this or has some decision teed up to do this. Now, now why blow the whistle on it? I would assume that their thinking is that the Chinese would maybe like to do this. And let's just, you know, why would they like to do it? Well, you know, they want to bleed the the US and Europe and bog us down there and and they they by the way all the weapons we're sending into Ukraine those are weapons that we can't send to Taiwan we've talked about this as shortages of 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 arms and just generally like you know they're on the the autocracy side of this war now um they would probably like that to just happen like they just start doing it and then people are like oh wow shit the chinese are supplying the russians and then everybody gets mad but yeah, it wouldn't be a secret it's already happening yeah, it would right show up. And and I think that their 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 hope must be that by spotlighting this and calling a lot of attention to it, the Chinese may have to like think twice about it. I, I'm not sure that's true because like if the Chinese give such a little shit about the Ukrainians that they're even willing to entertain this, that they're probably willing to do it. You know, um, I hope that that's true. I hope it works because as we talked about, if China comes in like this. It's a huge game changer in U.S.-China relations, relations between the West and China, and it's a huge lifeline to Russia that needs all the help they can get. I, you know, I've you and I were talking before we came in, like Lukashenko, the the dictator of Belarus and the kind of lackey of Putin, uh, the guy who literally the last time we met with Putin was caught on a mic saying, Putin's like, thank you for coming. And he said, did I have any other choice about whether to come? <laughs> yeah, um, he's in Beijing today, right? Now, there is no reason... Like there's no bilateral relationship between Belarus and no, China. No, this is like a like a pretty poor dictatorial country in Eastern Europe. Like China doesn't need to be like hosting. A, it's a state visit for, for, for dictator of Belarus. That tells me a lot. Like that tells me the Chinese have made a decision. Maybe not a decision to arm them lethally, but it's pretty clear whose side they're on in the war. Oh, for sure. You know, and uh, I can only imagine what he's talking to Lukashenko about, and maybe what he's talking. Yeah, I don't know whether they're going to route some of these arms through Belarus. I don't know what the hell the deal is, but to me, that is like a blinking red light of like, uh, okay, this is uh, this is the axis that is kind of coming together here, and it's um, it's not a good development. No, yeah. the other th- uh, other arms sale development I saw was the White House said they're concerned Russia may supply Iran with fighter jets, so everyone's arming everyone these days. <laughs> Uh, the Wall Street Journal, though, Ben, reported that uh, Germany, France, and Britain have floated a new defense pact of sorts with Ukraine. So the idea is to offer Ukraine access to more advanced military gear once the war ends as a way to encourage uh, Ukraine to begin peace talks with Russia now or later this year. The journal said that you know there's a lot of growing doubts among leaders in European capitals that Ukraine it will be, ever be able to fully push Russia out of its territory and that French President Emmanuel Macron in particular has been trying to deliver a kind of like a tough love message to Zelensky to say, you're going to have to 
cut a tough deal like the Germans and the Russians negotiated in World War II, you know, you're going to have to do this. Uh, it might include losing territory. This proposal does not mean NATO membership. It does not mean NATO troops in Ukraine. Uh, meanwhile, though, you've got former <laughs> Russian President Dmitry Medvedev suggesting that Russia's security might require pushing back Poland's borders. <laughs> Medvedev, mean, everything the guy says sounds like it came after about a bottle and a half of vodka. Uh, yeah, yeah, at least. Uh, so that's, you know, war with NATO. Um, Tony Blinken, Secretary of State, is in Kazakhstan urging them not to help uh, Russia evade sanctions. So a lot going on here. <laughs> it's a lot um, here. It is, though, notable, though, that, you know, according to this journal report, and really, you know, this we've heard soundings of this publicly before, uh, the conversation in European capitals is pretty different than the message Joe Biden was trying to send in, in Kiev last week about, like, enduring U.S. commitment to defend all of Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so first of all, we may need a segment called World War Watch. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we've talked about that an uncomfortable amount of times thus far, but it's, if you have... China arming Russia and Russia arming Iran that is also arming Russia. Like, you know, we've talked about how the flashpoints are Ukraine, Iran, Taiwan. Like, there's the other team, you know. Yeah. Um, it's well, kind of, obviously the kickback for the Iranian drones. That, well, the, exactly, yeah. right? But it, it does show that these evolving blocks, right, of the West and, you know, Japan and Australia and a couple other countries versus these other guys. Um, so that's just flogging that. <laughs> um, it's interesting to me, like, the debate is being waged with an unusual degree of ferocity on this question of what Ukraine should get. What that tells me is that in all these conversations, like the Munich Security Conference that took place, which we, you know, you can kind of snicker at the Munich Security Conference is kind of like the security Davos, but mm-hmm. it is like everybody goes to that thing, right? right? It's pretty clear to me that the debates and arguments that were happening at this conference are spilling out now into the open, right? Because you have, on the one hand, I don't know how many articles I've read <laughs> in the last few days from, you know, in the, in the Atlantic or, you know, the or from the neocons or from the, you know, really intense Ukraine supporters like Mike McFall. Like, there's clearly a coordinated effort among p- some people who are, are worried about what they're hearing. Yeah. But like, like, look, what I'm guessing is that the, 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 the hardcore Ukraine supporters are like, they don't like what they're picking up in places like Munich from the Europeans and others, and maybe even people in the Biden administration who are kind of like, where is this going? Like, we need to start thinking about an end game. And that end game probably doesn't involve, like, taking Crimea back and every inch of Ukrainian territory. And so they're out there now at full decibel volume. Give them everything. Give them everything they need. Do give it them, now. Do it now. The way to end the war is, is to give them more stuff faster. Fighter jets are only the beginning of this and everything. And, and some of that may also be that if you set the bar really far <laughs> to the right, like at least sure. you get them some more stuff. And it, it seems like there's a quieter view that is you know, concerned about this and, and the Europeans are on the front end of this. And I, I think the U.S. administration probably has both of these views inside of it. Um, the Biden administration. And so everybody's trying to influence the Biden administration. That's kind of how I read what's going on. Um, Look, I think that we've talked so much about, and we did on the, on the special episode, but like, we'll know more in the next few months about do tanks make a big difference? Do, can the Ukrainians, is the Russian military buckling? Um, uh, uh, Like, uh, are the Ukrainians going to take back significant territory? Is the momentum going to kind of propel them such that if we do keep pouring in weapons, they can make huge territorial gains? Or is this feeling more and more like a stalemate? And I just think we have to be informed by that. Uh, uh, You know, I think it's prudent to kind of make decisions based on what's happening on the ground here, you know? But it feels pretty pivotal to me right now. I mean, like, like this question of like open up the full aperture of weapons versus try to land the plane, um, which by the way, neither both of those things probably won't work. <laughs> you know, like yeah, I, I, I don't both. think just arming the Ukrainians with everything will like lead the war to end. Nor do I think there's like some peace deal to be had. But I mean, you 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 sense the opinion beginning to open up in terms of the different camps on this. Yeah, uh, switching gears here. So last week we talked about the World Bank. Uh, right after we recorded, or a day or two after we recorded, President Biden announced 
uh, that a guy named Ajay Banga will be the next president of the World Bank. He is the former president and CEO of MasterCard. Uh, he's a long career in business. In this announcement, uh, Biden highlighted uh, Banga's ability to bring together public and private funding to tackle problems like climate change, as we talked about last week. The hope is to reshape the mission, the mission of the World Bank to focus on climate change in addition to poverty alleviation because they are inextricably linked. Yeah. Uh, Banga is a, a naturalized U.S. citizen, but was born in India. He went to school there. According to the Washington Post, you have some activists who are disappointed by the choice, uh, in part because they hope Biden would name the first woman to lead the, the World Bank. Uh, others felt that Banga was too closely aligned with Wall Street. Um, I'll be honest, I do not know much about him, uh, but it seems like, Ben, the White House had been prepared for this opening because they moved really fast to name someone once the previous Trump goon uh, step down. Well, yeah, they, they'd come under some pressure and some criticism uh, for not shoving the Trump goon overboard. Right. You know? yeah, yeah, climate, um, dying, Trump dune. yeah. So look, anybody's a huge improvement over the Trump climate denying goon. Um, what's interesting to me also is like we when we and the Obama administration filled the vacancy with with Jim Kim, one of the things that, you know, the U.S. gets criticized for is that there's this kind of weird deal where the U.S., usually gets to pick the leader of the World Bank and the Europeans get to pick the leader of the IMF, yep. which has kind of weird, you know, colonial, colonial vibes, <laughs> yeah, vibes sure, you know, yeah. especially given that the World Bank and the IMF are usually operating in the, the developing world and yeah. like the, the formerly colonized countries. Um, and what's interesting to me is so Jim Kim was uh, uh, similarly an American born in another country uh, in South Korea. The, the, so part of how this can be read is them trying to Signal diversity in the sense that, you know, this isn't just some, you know, white guy born in the U.S. Yeah. This is somebody. Bob Zellick. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. This is somebody who, who was born in another country and has this kind of global business experience. Um, so that's just kind of notable because it's interesting to watch how the U.S. and Europe are trying to evolve their approach to these institutions. Look, anybody that prioritizes climate and, and, and the linkages you talked about, climate and poverty alleviation and migration, like the, the World Bank should be a better tool, much better tool than it has been to date in being a part of the climate finance solution. So like this guy will get in there because that's usually what happens when the U.S. picks a candidate. And let's hope that that, that it works. You know? Yeah, let's hope it works. Uh, some big immigration news, Ben. Uh, the Biden administration proposed uh, a series of new immigration regulations, including a rule that says, uh, except for some narrow exceptions, that migrants are Ill, ineligible for asylum if they enter the U.S. unlawfully. Uh, the administration is also reportedly considering a new policy that would fast track deportation of migrants who don't schedule an appointment at a U.S. border port of entry or request protection from another country while traveling to the U.S. These policies would take effect on May 11th. They're supposed to stay in place for two years. The Biden administration says they're putting these policies in place now in anticipation of a, a potential surge of migration at the southwest border when the uh, pandemic era Title 42 rule expires. That was a rule we've talked about many times that allowed the government to basically expel all migrants uh, in the name of pandemic protection. Immigration activists uh, are furious about this. They denounced the rule. They compared it to Trump era policies. Um, just stepping back, like I think clearly this speaks to how difficult the problem is yeah. and how impossible it is to solve without some sort of action by Congress. And also, if we're being honest, how bad the, the White House thinks the politics are. Yeah. Um, because these are pretty draconian steps. These are, you know, people comparing these to sort of like Stephen Miller policies have a point. Uh, I am also struggling, I hate these changes, but I'm also struggling to figure out w a better way to address uh, the influx of migration because what the administration is pointing to is, is saying, look, we set up these special parole categories for countries like Venezuela and Cuba and two others, uh, and, and illegal border crossings have dropped 97%. So they're trying to say that's now a new model they can use to try to fix, you know, this enormous backlog of yeah. asylum cases, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know that this is the right way to do it, but clearly this is sort of the path they're going down. Yeah, I mean, it's not all the way to like the the, the Trump uh, policies, but it is fairly draconian. Uh, uh, but like, uh, when you have Title Forty Two going away, and you have like the 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 spring is actually also the time of year when you sometimes see an right. uptick. Like, right. it, it's not irrational to try to get ahead of that in some fashion. I think right? they're projecting um, maybe double 
the number per day arriving at the border from last year's peak. Yeah. So a huge influx. And, 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 you know, like this is excruciating and you're always going to like, you know, th- there are always going to be fair critiques leveled at this. I mean, I, I think the challenge is they're trying to deter that migration, which is not an inhumane thing in the sense that it, it's also not safe if you have like huge floods of people trying to get to the border because Title 42 goes away and because of the weather and right. a bunch of factors. So I also think that we should just expect that this is, as you said, their read of the politics and that in the less than two years running up to a presidential election, like you're usually going to see like a pretty enforcement heavy approach at yeah. the border, you know? Yeah. Uh, last thing before the interview. Uh, so, Ben, remember feels like a million years ago now, that hilarious week or two when Elon Musk rolled out Twitter Blue <laughs> yeah, program yeah. and everyone started yeah. impersonating brands and people and we were all having a great time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, things have been going so poorly for Twitter since. They've fired most of the staff, including some more layoffs recently. Uh, but the Washington Post reported that Twitter has finally found some willing and eager buyers for their Twitter Blue verification program where you can just buy a little blue check which is accounts that like to push around uh, Russian propaganda. This is according to a research group called Reset. Uh, One of the accounts describes itself in English as a, quote, no woke, no BLM, no gender pronouns, just (laughs) anti-imperialism, purporting to be based in San Francisco. It's this blonde woman in a a Russian fur hat with a hammer and sickle badge. It feels like they're confusing some archetypes there. Yeah, there's a lot going on there. It's not like a right-wing, left-wing. There's another account... uh, where just the blurb says, doing my part to stop Western support for the Ukrainian war machine, one taxpayer at a time. This regular tweets videos of Russians killing Ukrainian soldiers. Uh, so great news for free speech defender Elon Musk. You are doing uh, yeoman's work when it comes to helping governments push around propaganda. I, d- I like, I, first of all, I, I, I have not been using Twitter as much recently. Um, for a lot of reasons, including like just generalized mental health and the central role that 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 rich goober like David Sachs plays over there. Yeah, you know? sucks, yeah. But like I'm looking at now, I I still have a blue check mark. Yeah, I think is that because they just haven't soon. gotten to me yet. Or they just go get, yeah, yeah. They're, like uh, they're gonna take it from they're you. gonna take it from me. I mean, because this is so fucking dumb. Like I never even I don't even know how I got in the first place. I think uh, when I left the White House. Um, it just happened. The it was, great, well, it was a magic no, process. No, no. When I left the White House, the great. Tanya Sominator oh, um, hooked, you up. hooked me up because she had all the the ends at Twitter, right? But like, I just don't like this. It's interesting to me that there's these people that are so fixated on this blue check mark as some. Well, it's not just a blue check. It it, it prioritizes you in search. It does. It makes more people see I, your yeah, stuff. So yeah. that's why this like it propaganda matters. piece like kind of matters. But d- there's a bit an element. Did you read the Sneeches and when you were a kid the Dr. Seuss book? Uh, probably. Where there's like the star belly Sneeches and then those Sneeches without the stars sure. on their bellies, okay. and then some guy comes and he makes a machine. To give the non-star bellied sneeches stars, and then it all gets mixed up as to who's better than who. Yeah, it's ringing a There's bell. something to this. Like th- oh. this is basic. Read the sneeches if you understand like this Elon Musk fixation on these blue check. I mean, I know he's trying to monetize it too, but there's there's this kind of weird thing that this is actually like a a status thing too. Look, I, I, the the point is the Russians and the Chinese and whomever are going to try to manipulate and take advantage of any one of these things, um, and and like. Elon Musk is not going to like outsmart them with his brain trust of of tech bro crypto goobers over there and and in, uh, in HQ. Yeah, yeah, and also I just think we're like on the precipice of fake news being so much worse than it ever was before. He, here's actually an expert on it uh, talking about. Here's a clip. Yo, Ben, Tommy, it's Barack. Look, I just wanted to drop a note to say thank you again for helping me fake Osama bin Laden's death. I still can't believe we pulled that shit off. It was almost as impressive as when Kennedy faked the moon landing, because as you know, he wasn't actually assassinated. Hope to see you both at the Deep State holiday party later this year. And remember, don't boo, vote. Because ghosts are real, and they will fucking kill you if you sass talk them. I... Uh, uh. Uh, <laughs> can't stop making stupid <laughs> AI generated. I, I just voices. They're, they're so good though. Like uh, like be, th- that that's particularly good. I had not heard that. Uh, to like, those of us, uh, to the seven billion people not on our text chain, like <laughs> well, th- you that, missed the several of these that you said, but that's a pretty good one. That yeah. one, like, so it's really this technology <laughs> is like hinky. Like you, 
you delete a period one place and it changes the inflection, you know, four sentences later. So you really just kind of like have to mess with it to get it right. Like the one I did for PSA, like actually really sounded like the I heard that one, yeah, tones that, yeah, that like Joe yeah. Biden did. And that was your best Biden too, because I've heard your other Joe Bidens, some of which are well, even that, funnier than the PSA one, but they that didn't was sound different as good. audio. Yeah. It was uh, yeah. that was a speech audio. But the bottom line is like even something where the the <laughs> language itself is like self evidently ridiculous and not real, hearing it sound that much like the person it's purported to be, fooled a lot of people. I had a lot of folks being like, I can't believe that that clip. I thought it was real for a minute until I saw the comments, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, it just makes me realize that there is this like fake news nightmare coming down the tracks. And over on Twitter, you got Elon Musk and this skeleton team of people that don't seem to really care about this stuff unless it's sort of like defending David Sachs or other right-wing voices. And it's going to be a real problem. So I remember like back in the height of the Iran deal fight in 2015 or something, um, I was interviewed at something by a friend of the pod, Jeff Goldberg. Uh, and, you know, somebody like one of these right wing like assholes uh, tweeted like Ben Rhodes to Jeff Goldberg. And he put in quotes, the kiss of the nuke deal will turn the Iranian frog into a prince. And he put that in quotes. And obviously didn't say that sure, or anything it like it. Doesn't sound like you now. And uh, they wrote articles off it though. Like of Breitbart, course. Breitbart had a headline like Ben Rhodes says the kiss of the nuke deal is a prince, and and I'm in the fucking White House, and people I have no are, power to stop this, right? Like are gullible. There are all these stories, and Jeff Goldberg. I had to ask Jeff Goldberg to like tweet out like Ben Rhodes didn't say this, and, and the point is that like if, like you said that like, that was self evidently crazy language, but like people see something in quotes, they believed it. Like we are. We talked about the chat bot last week, you know, like, like we're heading into like some new terrain, like, like that could make the last decade feel like the warm up act, you know, mm-hmm. um, when you take AI and chat bots and deep fakes and, 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 and governments are now at war with each other, right? China and Russia and the rest of us, like we could be heading into a, like a deeply, deeply strange time. This is totally unregulated. Um, you could, you could use AI. I mean, I, I think about just like to go down the AI rabbit hole real quick. Like when I was in Taiwan, I met with some disinformation people that showed me like fake speeches that they said were created by Emmanuel Macron, mm-hmm. like, like saying that like the U S is declining and China's rising. And I was like, like AI could create an entire news ecosystem. Oh, absolutely. To validate a piece of disinformation. Right. Of course. So instead of just having a fake Macron speech, you could have, News articles about the fake speech, right? And, and TV hosts and Macron's and voice saying before, the speech, yeah. and then TV, and then Tommy Vitor and Ben Rhodes yeah. on Pod Save the World talking about this Macron speech. AI could generate that instantaneously, There's right? There's no way we're going to be able, or that people are going to have the time or wherewithal to figure out what's real or not. Yeah, they're just going to give up. So what do you do about it? I don't know. It's really worrisome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're yeah. going to need some real technology solutions. But the problem is, other than take edibles and make really funny yeah, uh, speeches, well, that's, yeah, that part's just <laughs> fun. But yeah, I mean, listen, if I can, you know, make a pretty realistic sounding Barack Obama voice with a five dollar, you know, yeah, website, like imagine what the Russian what is the GRU going to be yeah, doing? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's really bad. Anyway, on that light note, yeah. uh, we're going to take a break, uh, and when we come back, you'll hear from Marav Mikhaili, the leader of Israel's Labor Party. So stick around for that. Our guest today is Meirav Mikhaili. She is the leader of Israel's Labor Party. Uh, Meirav, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me. And just let me, um, I want to ease your mind on this, okay? My first acquaintance with the U.S., was in 1983 when I was on the Scouts delegation. And then nobody could pronounce Marav and they did, and they uh, call me Mirage. So, Oh, God. Listen, I-, I can't pronounce anything correctly. And I've grown up with people calling me Vitor, Vietor, Tommy Vitor. So, let, you know, I figure everyone just has a little grace on this stuff. Uh, there's so much I want to cover today. Uh, but I was hoping we could start with the changes to Israel's judiciary that Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu is trying to ram through the Knesset, uh, Israel's parliament as we speak. Can you just describe for for listeners what Netanyahu and this you know super right wing, super orthodox coalition is trying to do and what the impact would be? So they're bringing a package of legislations that are um, aimed at crushing Uh, weakening dramatically our judicial system, politicizing it, and giving almost exclusive power to the government. Now, Netanyahu has been in power for 13 years in a row. He was prime minister. 
He never um, did anything to fix the judicial system. But mm -hmm. now, um, and we can elaborate on that um, in a short while, uh, different interests are colliding. First and foremost is his interest to escape his own trial because he stands trial for three criminal uh, charges and he wants out. So um, there's a huge, huge protest that's been taking place in Israel for eight weeks already. People are taking to the streets in hundreds of thousands uh, every week again and again and even more and more every week. And we, what we're also seeing is people and sectors who have never taken a stand on anything. Uh, officials who were appointed by Netanyahu, um, the, the high-tech sector, uh, nurses or, or uh, social workers, or really people who never ever took a stand. Uh, and the most senior um, economics and all of them, you cannot find one economic in Israel who will speak in favor of this so-called reform, the coup that they want to bring about. Um, so, and you probably also heard the warnings from the president of the United States, uh, Joe Biden, and uh, French president in the UN, and today it's also the foreign minister of Germany. So really everyone is telling Netanyahu to stop. The majority of Israelis, and we see this in, in polls, do not want this uh, so-called reform. Um, and this is, this is what's on the line now. Now they passed their first reading in a, um, uh, you, you know, one of their right wing, now he's not in the in parliament, but he used to be, once said that there needs to be a D9 going on uh, over the Supreme Court in Israel. So there's a feeling of them coming with a D9 on the Knesset now and passing the first reading. So now we are uh, repositioning ourselves to stop the second and third reading and to not allow this to pass. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to suss out what that would look like, because you're right. I mean, I, I read that there were 160,000 people uh, in the streets this weekend in Tel Aviv alone. Uh, you see people like former Prime Minister Ehud Barak calling this uh, changes the laws of dictatorship. The former mm -hmm. head of the Mossad said if these changes go through, members of the military should legitimately disobey orders because the government is now illegitimate. I mean, those are... Those are as stark criticisms of a of a legal change as I've ever heard in in any country. But I, mean, right. I guess my question is like, what avenues exist currently to potentially block these changes from happening, or does BB just have the numbers in the Knesset and can kind of push it through if he decides? Well, I suppose that in principle he can push it through if he decides, but. Um, it is still a way. We do have still the parliamentarian uh, tools that in which we can delay, stall, you know, make it more difficult for them. Secondly, um, you know, there's always the hope that the few decent people that are left on Likud will do the right thing and not give Netanyahu the fingers that he needs in order to be able to pass this. Because uh, um, even Likud people are saying there was no discussion within the party and there was zero discussion within the government about this um, so, so dangerous initiative that they're pushing forward. And I know for a fact, and it's, it's not a secret that some of them are very much against it. So there's always the hope of people being decent people and doing the, the right thing. But not only that, I think it's, it's the, the protest that is really grassroots and is really amazing. It's something that they did not see coming. If you came to the stage of the big, big, big rally outside of the Knesset two, um, two weeks ago, I think it was, you could see around the stage, not only one, but many former uh, prime ministers, all I think all the living ones, um, mm -hmm. and former members, of, uh, heads of Mossad and Shabak, and really so many seniors, former officials that were there. It was unbelievable to see. But the most amazing thing is that the current officials dare to, you know, stand up and say, this is very, very dangerous. It's going to crash 
not only Israeli democracy, which of course is the number one thing, but also the economy and also security. And we're already seeing, and this is no coincidence, no, no coincidence in the sense that it's not by chance that when they are pushing forward this initiative that will really uh, crush Israeli democracy, we are seeing um, the violent settlers um, acting out the way they did and, and uh, really doing this terror attack that they did uh, the other night in, in Hawala. Um, yeah. it, it, it really is generating this um, insecurity in the country from every every aspect you can think of. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you, you raised this violence because it's very scary sort of to watch from the United States. The cycle of violence seemed to pick up. The most recent events where these two Israeli brothers were stuck in traffic. They were shot dead by a Palestinian gunman. Uh, in right. response, these settler groups rampaged through a Palestinian town. I think they burned over a dozen homes, dozens of cars. Uh, I know that Israel has since deployed troops to the West Bank to try to keep the peace. But there are a lot of allegations, and you see this repeatedly, uh, that IDS soldiers or border police were uh, potentially providing protection for the settlers during the violence or didn't do enough to stop it. What do we know about those allegations in this instance? I can't tell you that I am aware of the details of any research that I'm sure is taking place um, and should be taking place very seriously. But again, it's not this needs to be handled in the hardest and the severest possible way, of course. But what I'm saying is that it goes together. It, these are the uh, destructive powers that exist and have been cultivated by Netanyahu for many, many years that exist in Israeli society and Israeli politics uh, and have been uh, and are being cultivated by him for many, many years. He is the one who uh, brought them into the Knesset, and now he brought them onto the government. And it goes hand in hand. So it's it's imperative to understand that I think this um, attempt of his to alter the regime in Israel and to turn it into a non-democracy, into something totalitarian, almost totalitarian or totalitarian, is a wake-up call for a lot of Israelis to understand that it goes hand in hand with those uh, very, very dangerous forces, which he brought uh, onto the government, but are uh, doing the things that they've been doing in the West Bank. So to answer, to finish uh, the answer to your previous um, question, Netanyahu does not have any legitimacy for what he's doing. This is not something that he's promised on his campaign, during the campaign. He did not say, I'm going to alter the judicial uh, system and change um, Israeli democracy. He talked about uh, personal security. He talked about free education from uh, the age of birth to the age of three. He talked about things that are really bothering Israelis. And instead, what he brought is a coup that is good only for those who are currently in power in order to leave them in power forever. Right, so right. there is a major, major backlash and he knows that he does not has uh, have any legitimacy, and this is this is why they constantly speak about um, negotiation or agreement or coming together to sit down and talk because the only uh, people who can give him legitimization right now are the opposition, and this is why Labour is standing up and saying there's no way uh, we should give him uh, this legitimization. We should not save Netanyahu from what he's uh, brought on himself, on everyone. We should just uh, bring the protest and the resistance to a point where they can, they just can't uh, go through with this. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting to, to hear you call uh, this settler violence a terrorist attack. A lot of people sort of were surprised when the US State Department called the Palestinian gunmen's attack a terrorist attack and then referred to settler violence as settler violence, but it does seem like both instances are, are terrorism, sort of the definition of terrorism, terrorizing a community. And it also just seems to me that in some ways, what we've seen from these settler communities is the logical extension of uh, collective punishment on Palestinian communities, right? I mean, it's the official government policy to seal the family homes of Palestinian terrorists. There has been discussion about uh, rescinding social security benefits that go to the relatives 
of attackers. And I, I just wondered if you think, you know, these settlers and these communities are sort of taking direction from the top, from senior members of BB's coalition. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. And I really don't care whether they give it or take it or give it back. I mean, really, I don't care how they split the jobs between them. What I care is that they are uh, being handled and stopped. And what I care is that we realize that there is no way to um, solve this conflict without a peaceful political solution. Now, mm -hmm. it is difficult. It is complicated. Uh, there is also a problem on the Palestinian side. It's not, it's not like the yeah. Palestinians are reaching out to us constantly. Far from it. And there's um, constant terror being um, uh, executed by, of course, Hamas, or uh, now we have new organizations that were um, revealed and acted against by the IDF. So the the, situ the reality here is difficult. There is a lot of Palestinian terrorism. We need to acknowledge that even uh, us who are really peace people and really believe and are pushing uh, towards a peaceful solution. We can't look away from the dangers and the challenges and uh, terrorism. But uh, the fact that this is the situation right now should never discourage us from looking for the peaceful solution, the political solution that needs to be found uh, at the end of the day. Because otherwise, uh, what, what we're constantly seeing is the constant deterioration towards, you gave some examples, but they're plenty more. This is not where we should be heading, but con on contraire, the other way around. Find, even if it's little solution in the beginning, little solutions. Uh, by the way, at the beginning of, I think, last week or this week or whatever, who can remember, um, Netanyahu reached uh, agreements with the Palestinian Authority. The, the amazing thing is that this burst out after they reached an agreement to strengthen the Palestinian Authority, something that I strongly support. Uh, and and the, the Palestinian Authority has committed to do its best to prevent uh, terror as much as it possibly can. Problem is, since the Palestinian Authority was being weakened for so long, that its ability has been uh, is now less than it used to be in the past. And right, the, right. The, uh, the two voices in which Netanyahu, what he does is on one hand, he speaks against the, against the Palestinian Authority. He speaks against the legitimacy of, of dealing with them. And on the other hand, he goes and, and deals with them. And unfortunately, also, also was dealing with Hamas for um, many, many years. Yeah. So, you know, we've been talking today about all the ways Israel has changed, its new right wing government, uh, these judicial reforms. But despite all those changes, very little about U.S. policy towards Israel seems to have changed. President Biden basically doesn't seem to want to have any public disagreements with Netanyahu, whether it's on Iran, whether it's on a two state solution or settlements. It's just sort of like the standard talking points. What would you uh, and other members of the Labor Party or other progressives in Israel like to see from the United States when it comes to U.S. policy that might actually help, I don't know, push back on some of these right wing parties or proposals? Well, first and foremost, you know, as, a, as an Israeli, as an Israeli patriot, as an Israeli leader, the relationship, the special relationship with the U.S. are, of course, very dear to me uh, emotionally and strategically just as much. And I wouldn't want to see it get hurt, but um, I hope we never get to the point where Israel changes its character from the democracy that it is, uh, that in a way that may, God forbid, jeopardize this special uh, relationship. Uh, there's also a difference between what officials um, and the administration can and should do and uh, friends of Israel and people who Israel is dear to them and understand the importance of its existence, I would say first and foremost, of course, to the Jewish people, but not only. Those people, that is my, maybe my most important message to them. To say for, you know, I've been, I'm a member of uh, the opposition, the political opposition. I was, I'm, I'm in politics for 10 years, but I've been saying this before, long before I was in formal politics. Ne 
Israel is not Netanyahu. And our friends and allies and partners to the same values and to the genuine um, original Zionism, which is about self-governing and not about um, dominating anyone else other than govern ourselves. And that it is about a home for the Jewish people, but with complete and total equality for all of its citizens and with separation of uh, state and religion and with striving towards a just society and reaching out to agreements with our neighbors. Those allies of ours, those partners and friends, um, we need you to not walk away from Israel. We need you to realize and to recognize that the majority of Israelis are not supporting what Netanyahu has been doing. He has been um, operating this huge industry of brainwashing, which you as Americans, as post-Trump Americans know all too well. Yeah, we do. So just imagine living under this for so long and you can be so effective in helping us beating that and taking Israel back to the Zionist vision. vision the thing that is needed in order to be able to finding a solution for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and to rebuilding Israel as it began, as it is supposed to be. That is my most important message, maybe. The administration is one thing. It's more complex. But there are so many people in so many positions who care about Israel, do not give up on us. There's really no reason why we shouldn't be able to build it back. The majority of Israelis are afraid of Arabs because be, they're being told morning, day, and night that they're against them. But they are not racists uh, or not chauvinists in a way um, you know it from uh, some people in America. It's a whole different culture, which is really much more pro-pluralism, uh, much more pro-acceptance. And there's so much to work with. This is what we need to do, work with it and rebuild what needs to be rebuilt in Israel. Hopefully the Labor Party will be a big part of that process. Uh, you recently said the Labor Party is stuck in the mud and I have the mission of rescuing and rebuilding it. How are you going to do that? Well, first of all, um, you know, a party we need to always remember is a tool in order to build the country back and the state of Israel. It's not it's not a standalone. But when you look at um, Israeli parliament today, the only uh, democratic Zionist party is labor. And this is why it's so essential to not only keep it, but really to revive it and to rebuild it. So how am I gonna do this? You know, how just the, the long way of a lot of work <laughs> to bring new forces on board to do the grassroots work of going back to speaking to people all over the country, something that was not done in labor for many, many years, and to bring on board powerful partners who can help us bring and um, build the platforms that our side of the political map does not have and therefore is in such an unequal position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the right wing in Israel, which has huge platforms and so many of them. And again, not something that is strange to you. You are no strangers to this uh, situation. Right. And and there's no reason why we can't build what we need to build and, and win. I believe that we can win and I want to win. Our side of the political map uh, has suffered so many losses and so many uh, disappointments from its own leaders so many times that I think they gave up, many people gave up on the concept of winning. Well, I haven't, and I'm telling you, it's achievable. So that's what I'm going to be doing, building this this prospect. That's a great message, a great place to, uh, to leave it on. Look, as a Democrat, I know what it's like to spend some time in the political wilderness, but uh, we're back over here, uh, and I believe you guys will be too. So thank you so much for doing the show. Thanks for for uh, helping us all understand what's going on and uh, best of luck. Thank you, Tommy. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Thanks again, Ra, for joining the show. Uh, thanks, uh, Barack Obama, <laughs> for um, helping with uh, conspiracy theories. I was going to put in there that only keep this secret between you, me, and Seymour Hirsch, but that he wouldn't say the name right. 
Uh, oh, you tried that? No. Oh, yeah. It didn't, it didn't you come couldn't. Well, I actually, that, that's normal for Obama's, like, sh- shares some of our own pronunciation problems. He does. So, Massachusetts. Uh, yeah, yeah. or uh, Ang, Ang Sang. Remember, he kept produce, pronouncing Ang Sang Suu Kyi's name wrong. Um, so, How dare uh, you. yeah. Point being is it like, actually would have been authentic if the, if you screwed if it up. the AI screwed up the uh, pronunciation. Fair enough. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll come back to that story. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> come we'll, back be, we'll be making more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, talk to you guys next week. See ya.